I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. <laughs> my homies, my homies, what's popping? Lay here. This one's going to be Tiago Santos taking on Johnny Walker. Super, super fire main event. It's the same story, guys. We're looking to make the right predictions. We move on from UFC 266. And what a fire card that was. Just amazing. The predictions were pretty decent too. And like I say, man, different week, same story. We're looking to make the right predictions, the right bets. So let's do it, man. Hamzat, smash that like button. Let's break them down. All right, we've got Alexander Hernandez taking on Mike Breeden. Now, Alexander Hernandez was originally supposed to fight Leo Santos, but now he's fighting Mike Breeden, which in my opinion is a way easier matchup than Leo Santos. I know Leo Santos is over 40 years old, but man, Mike Breeden only 10, 13 pro fights. Whereas Leo Santos has quite a bit of UFC experience, high level black belt. You know, this matchup seems to be an easier matchup. Now, despite it being an easier matchup, in my opinion, Alexander Hernandez still needs to get in there and fight Mike Breeden. This is a good opportunity for Mike, you know, short notice, no pressure. Looking at a bit of tape on Mike Breeden, the guy doesn't look too bad. You know, the boxing's okay. Everything he's doing looks pretty okay. And that's probably because he trains at Glory, which is under James Krause. We know how good James Krause is when it comes to coaching these guys, right? So if I'm Mike Breeden, I'm listening to James Krause every day. And I'm going to take the advice that he gives me in order to beat Alexander Hernandez. Having said all of that, guys, I can't really see Hernandez losing this one. You know, this one would be a real drop of the ball if Alexander Hernandez lost this one. You know, you look at what Alexander done to Chris Grootsmacker. He's not really a striker. You know, he's more of a wrestler. But when you see him do that, you know, the game is improving. The problem with Alexander is it's not always there. Against Thiago Moises, he just, he looked horrible. Against Drew Dober, you know, nothing there. So yeah, man, it's one of those situations with Alexander. Some nights he's on, some nights he's off. I'm going to predict against Mike Breeden that he's on, right? Whether it's takedowns or using his striking. I see Alexander winning this one. Now, maybe the the real place we're going to make some money on this one is predicting the prop on Alexander, right? Let's say Alexander wins this one. Instead of playing a money line that's most likely going to be juiced up, maybe we have to predict how Alexander wins. I'm going to say decision. I'm going to say Mike Breeden is game enough to come in here and... Put on, a, put on a nice performance over 15 minutes, but ultimately, I see Alexander winning. So the first prediction is going to be Alexander decision. My odds, I'd have to go at least, at least a minus 300 on Alexander. And the actual numbers, we've got minus 300 up to minus 400 on Alexander. So yeah, man, the real place we're going to make some money, we've got to pick the right method. I'm going to say decision for Alexander. All right, we've got Shauna Young taking on Stephanie Egger. Man, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. You know, this is, it's a pick em. Let's be honest, this one's a pick em. If you're Shauna Young, you probably want to, you probably want to fight this one away from the grappling. So kicking, punching, look to strike with Stephanie Egger. Now, if you're Stephanie Egger, you don't really want to be striking because you're not a striker. For those of you that don't know Stephanie Egger, this girl is a high-level no-gi jiu-jitsu player. She tried to use that credential in her UFC debut, but Tracy Cortez, you know, good fight IQ, good grappler herself. Now, this time she's got a easier matchup, in my opinion, against Shana Young. But again, man, it's... It's a difficult one to be confident in because Stephanie Egger isn't 
anything other than a grappler. So if you've got somebody who's purely a grappler and they're not able to grapple, you've, you've got pretty much no chance. Shana Young isn't the next coming of Amanda Nunes or Valentina, you know, she's not this super elite girl, but she is the maybe more well-rounded fighter. You know, she is the better striker. So really what I'm seeing is if Stephanie Egger can't take this fight to the mat, can't take the back of Shana Young, I think she loses. Having said that, I am going to take Stephanie Egger. I took her in her UFC debut. The jiu-jitsu wasn't the result. You know, this time maybe it is. So yeah, I'll side with Stephanie Egger to get that submission. My numbers, man, you've got to keep them... You have to keep them close because if Stephanie Egger, like I said, isn't on the mat, yeah, I'll put Stephanie Egger around minus 130 and the actual numbers we've got. And we've got Stephanie Egger plus 100. So yeah, man, it's lined real close and there's a reason for that. If Stephanie Egger can take it to the mat, she's the winner, potentially. If Shana Young can avoid the grappling, she's the winner potentially it's low level man don't lay too much money there's no need to lay too much money here all right we've got Antonina Shevchenko taking on Casey O'Neill pretty decent matchup in the flyweight division now as we know Antonina Shevchenko is the sister of the GOAT Valentina she's not the same though you know she has the same DNA she has the same parents but she's not the same level of Valentina Shevchenko. Having said that, she does try to replicate the same art, right? She is a Muay Thai fighter, the same as Valentina. So that basically means she's looking to kick the opponent. If the opponent comes into close proximity, she's going to use the Muay Thai clinch, elbows, kni elbows, knees, her ground game, I wouldn't say it's terrible. I wouldn't say it's great. You look at the way she obliterated Lipsky on the mat. But then you look at Roxanne Modafferi, Andrea Lee, Caitlin Chukagian. All of these girls had success grappling against Antonina Shevchenko. Now against Casey O'Neill, a pretty decent grappler, Antonina should probably avoid the mat. Casey O'Neill, two wins, zero losses inside the UFC. This girl's looked pretty, pretty decent, man. I mean, the UFC debut, she obliterated Shana Dobson. And then you look at what she done to Lara Procopio, uh, displaying her jiu-jitsu against a black belt. Yeah, Casey O'Neill, I'm liking what I'm seeing. When Casey isn't using the grappling too, She's a Muay Thai fighter. If I had to pick who's the better Muay Thai fighter, I would say Antonina. But this isn't a Muay Thai fight, you know. This is mixed martial arts and we're probably going to get some grappling. Not only are we going to get some grappling, I do believe one fighter is going to slow down. If you look at Casey O'Neill, man, Shana Dobson was exhausted in round two. And Laura Procopio was exhausted round two, round three. Antonina Shevchenko is 36 years old. Casey O'Neill is 23. I'm going to say Antonina at some point gets very tired. And at that point, I believe Casey O'Neill will look to exploit the opponent again. Whether that's taking Antonina to the mat, choking her out, or, or a ground and pound stoppage. My prediction is going to be Casey O'Neill again displays a high pace and, and shows the opponent, hey, you can't hang with me. Your cardio is not good enough. Good matchup though, you know. Antonina, she's going to try to use that Muay Thai. It's for Casey O'Neill to keep a good pressure and look to grapple. My numbers, I'm going to put Casey O'Neill around minus 170. And we've got Casey O'Neill minus 200. A lot of respect. Yeah, it's nice to see. Yeah, I can't disagree with the betting line. Casey O'Neill, man, I basically see her fatiguing the opponent. Just like she's done previously. But yeah, good matchup. Man, this one's a banger. This one's a banger. Pure fire. 
And you know what we do on this channel when it's a fire matchup, guys. Amen to the matchmakers. We've got Nico Price taking on Alex Cowboy Oliveira. You know, if you had to find a word to explain this matchup, I would say craziness. Nico Price is just a guy who doesn't have much regard for his health. You know, he gets in there and he just, it's, it's go to war. Alex Oliveira is a guy who likes to go to war, but isn't the same level of toughness as a Nico Price. You know, Alex Oliveira is going to teep to the body. He doesn't mind opening up the opponent, you know. There's going to be blood when Alex Oliveira fights. But I do kind of question his willingness to fight when he slows down. You know, for the first round, Alex Oliveira, he's going to get crazy. He's going to go to war. But after that, you've got a tired man. And if you're a really decent fighter... You can beat Alex Oliveira. My prediction though, guys, I have to side with Nico Price. Purely because this man can go 15 minutes. And he can go hard for the 15 minutes, right? Now, he lost to Michelle Pereira. But you can see that if the fight continued, Nico Price was going to win that fight. So my prediction is going to come down to who's more willing to fight when it gets dirty. Who's more willing to fight when they fatigue? And who has more output? All of these questions, the answer is Nico Price, in my opinion. So yeah, we're going to go with Nico on this one. Maybe inside the distance, because Cowboy really does slow down. But it could be a decision. The only way I really see Alex Oliveira winning this one has to be a stoppage. And when you think of the striking defense of Nico Price... There's not really a time you, you can think of good striking defense, right? He is hittable. He loves to go to war. But the difference is one man's going to go to war longer than the other man. So it's for Cowboy Oliveira to find a finish. If he doesn't, yeah, that Nico Price finish, I think is coming. My numbers on this one, I'm going to go minus 180 on Nico Price. And we've got Nico Price, minus 120, minus 130. I mean, his striking defense isn't great. And that's why his price is close to evens. But like I said, man, if Alex Oliveira doesn't get that round one finish, it's going to turn into cardio and heart. And I think Nico wins that. So yeah, the pick is going to be Nico. And I think that money line is, is decent. All right, guys, this next matchup is... Maybe a pick em. It's a pretty decent matchup. You've got two South American veterans. Alejandro Perez taking on Johnny Eduardo. We haven't really seen these guys in a while either. Uh, Alejandro Perez got badly, badly hurt by Song Yudong. Yeah, it was serious too, you know. It wasn't like a normal knockout. He got sent to the Shadow Realm. Johnny Eduardo, it's been maybe three years or so since he lost to Nathaniel Wood. To be honest, man, thinking back to that fight, Johnny Eduardo was doing some nice work in round one. So it's kind of surprising that we haven't seen him in over three years. Maybe someone can leave a comment and let me know why. But yeah, thinking back to that one, he lost the fight. But despite losing, the work in round one, the striking work, yeah, it was decent. Both of these guys are true fighters. The veterans of the sport. Both guys tough as nails, man. So much experience on both sides. I'm going to say that Alejandro Perez comes back from that devastating knockout and uh, potentially retires Johnny Eduardo. But I kind of see violence. You know, I think Johnny Eduardo could maybe shock us. The best bet would maybe be the fight doesn't go the distance. You know, this fight kind of gives me the same vibes as Uros Medic and Jalen Turner. I can't see it going 15. Whether it's the boxing and speed of Alejandro Perez or Johnny Eduardo uses that veteran experience one last time. I don't see this one going 15 minutes. If I had to predict the winner, I'm going to go with the Mexican. I'm going to take Alejandro Perez. Yeah, my numbers, I'm going to put Alejandro Perez around... 
minus 170. You know, you can't be too confident either side. Both guys with layoffs and the actual numbers. We've got Alejandro Perez, minus 220. Yeah, it's an interesting fight, man. Looking forward to this one. Jamie Malarkey taking on Devontae Smith. Man, I'm going to have to say this one's a banger. And the only reason this one's a banger, Jamie Malarkey is a guy who just wants to knock you out. And he's willing to take all of the shots to find that knockout punch. Devontae Smith isn't exactly the same type of guy. He's not willing to take those shots. But he is a guy who can knock you out. And that's why this one's a banger. Looking at Jamie Malarkey's UFC career, he had that UFC debut against Brad Riddell. That UFC debut was just insane. Jamie Malarkey taking so many clean punches and just refusing to quit. Now against Karma Worthy, that lead hook to the jaw, so clean. So yeah, man, Jamie Malarkey is going to try to walk down Devontae Smith. He knows he can knock out Devontae. It's just finding that, it's finding that lead hook. Devontae Smith on the flip side, like I said, he's not willing to take the same type of shots as Jamie Malarkey. He's going to be more composed, wanting to fight at range. Guys, this is the type of matchup where whoever lands clean first, that's the winner. Now, I know that Jamie Malarkey is going to be willing to take the shots, to land his shots, but I, I don't like that. You know, because Devontae Smith can put you out. You know, the chin isn't exactly something that gets better over time. The more you get cracked in your chin, it's going to take less for you to go down. And that might be the case here. Maybe Devontae Smith is able to land that clean shot first. And he's able to put down Jamie Malarkey. But again, maybe the best bet here is fight doesn't go the distance. Because what if Jamie Malarkey does take those shots? And he lands his shot and Devontae can't take it. You know, it's a violent matchup, man. Both of these guys have knockout power. I'm going to side with the cleaner fighter. And I believe that is Devontae Smith. Not super confident, but that's going to be my prediction. Yeah, my numbers on this one. I'll put Devontae minus 150. And you've got Devontae minus 150, minus 160. Yeah, I think it's in the ballpark. Either guy can win this one. Devontae Smith doesn't want to take the shots. Jamie Malarkey's just a savage. Being a savage is good and bad, you know. You don't want to be a savage because you're getting hit a lot. But if you can get hit a lot and then find a knockout, you know, it's like a Nate Diaz style. Really decent matchup. I'm going to side with Devontae. Just not super confident. All right, my homies. Moving into Douglas Andrade taking on Gatano Perillo. Now, I've got to be honest, man. I've been going back and forth on this one. Changing my prediction. One second, I'm on Douglas Andrade. Then I'm on Gatano. And then I think, man, maybe the veteran is the better pick. This one... It's a dodgy one. I don't know. I think that's a bit dodgy, mate. Now, the reason why it's dodgy, Douglas Andrade is 36 years old and he kind of looks 36. When you look at him fight, you can tell he's at the end of his career. Now, Gaetano Perillo on the flip side, he debuted against Ricky Simone. We knew he would get blown out of the water and he really did. You know, Ricky Simone, really beautiful performance. Gatano can grapple, but I'm not sure if his grappling's good enough to take down Douglas Andrade. If this fight is kept kickboxing, again, I kind of think that Douglas Andrade, with the experience he has, it should be enough. But then you realise he's at the end of his career and Gatano should be winning. I think this one comes down to how highly you rate Gatano Perillo. You know, do you see him as a guy who should be in the UFC. Now, for me personally, guys, I'm going to have the answer to that question after this matchup. And I know that's no good, right? We want the answer to that question prior so we know where to put the bet. But sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's not possible. And personally, for me, I'm not sure how good Gatano Perillo really is. You know, anybody should be beating Douglas Andrade. And if you don't, you know, it's a real 
it's a real sign to any better that you may not be cut out for the UFC. And that's not disrespect on Douglas Andrade. It's just he's at the end of his career. You know? Man, this prediction really may backfire. Maybe I should just take a shot on Gatano, but I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stick with the veteran to get maybe one last win before he's done in the UFC. So I'm gonna take Douglas Andrade to be able to stay on the feet and use some boxing. And you know maybe proves that Gatano isn't cut out for the UFC. But like I said. The answer to that question. For me. It's going to be answered after this matchup. So yeah I'll side with the veteran. There's just no way that I'm betting on this one. No way. My numbers. I'll put the veteran around the minus 150. And we've got Douglas Andrade over minus 200. So that's what the bookies make of Gatano Perillo. They are answering the question prior to this fight. They are saying he is not good enough for the UFC. Now here's where maybe smart people make their money. Depending which side you bet on. Some people may look at Gatano Perillo and say, Do you know what? At plus 200... I think he may be good enough for the UFC. The other 50% are going to say, you know what? The bookies have lined this right. Gatano Perillo isn't cut out for the UFC. Even against Douglas Andrade. Whatever side you're on, I don't advise you put a lot of money at stake. You know, try to, try to play this one lightly. Because you've got an old man against a guy who, you know, I'm not sure how good he is. Vegas says not that good. I'm not sure if Vegas is right, but we're going to find out. I'm going to stick with the veteran, Douglas Andrade. All right, guys, we've got Betch Kohea taking on Carol Rosa. Now, this one, I'm way more confident in saying who's cut out for the UFC and who's not cut out for the UFC. Rosa, in my opinion, has been only impressive so far in the UFC. You know, her fight against Lara Procopio was kind of close in her debut, but then she completely dominated Vanessa Milo. And against Jocelyn Edwards, you know, the, the performance, four star, five star. I think it's fair to say that Rosa is getting better with each fight. And now she's coming up against a girl who may be out of her prime. Same as Douglas Andrade. The only difference is, I know how good Rosa is, right? Rosa is definitely cut out for the highest level. Betch Kohea has fought some good girls. You know, she's fought Ronda Rousey, Raquel Pennington, Holly Holm, Irene Aldana, Pani Kianzad, Sejara Eubanks. She's fought a lot of decent fighters. She's mainly a puncher, right? She wants to try to box your head off. Betch Kohea is primarily a pit bull, so she's looking to just be aggressive, get in your face, try to take your head off. But yeah, guys, with this matchup, I see Rosa doing whatever she wants, landing the low kick over and over, boxing combinations, takedowns whenever she wants. I think she dictates the pace, uh, the range, uh, just complete domination, you know. Carol Rosa, arguably one of the most confident picks on this card. And it's not really a downplay on Betch. I think she's kind of slow, a little bit stuck in the mud. And right now in 2021, yeah, it's a different time. So my prediction, guys, I'm going to take Rosa to stay undefeated, to remain a prospect in the weight class. Betch Kohea. I wish her all the luck. She's going to need it in this one. My numbers, I'm going to be pretty harsh. I'm going to put Rosa minus 300. And I'm interested to see the line. Yeah, man. Rosa minus 350. Yeah, Vegas knows what's up. And to be honest, man, I might still bet that. It's a juicy line, but, you know, really confident in Rosa. Hey, my homies, you know what time it is, man. If you waited to smoke with me, amen. If you've been smoking this whole time, double amen. If you're not a smoker, but you enjoy the smoke breaks, triple amen, gang. Let's go. Hey, guys, I hope you're doing well, doing blessed, having a good day, having a good week, man. Before we get into the smoke break, this is my Instagram, at UFC Lay, and this is my Patreon, at UFC GA. 
And that's where I place all of my bets on this card, the last card, the next card. A massive shout out to, to everyone who's on Patreon, man. 96 Patreons now, which is just insane. Much love, guys. Much love. We're going to place the bets on this one. Now, guys, before we get into the smoke break topic, which, to be honest, I haven't even got one for this smoke break. Before we get into it, I want to speak about UFC 266. Now, man, there's a lot to speak about, obviously, and I don't want to make the smoke break like 10 plus minutes. But just a few things real quick. Marab Davalishvili, this man's the Terminator. This man is the Terminator. How didn't he go out? Oh my goodness, just crazy. I want to shout out Nick Diaz, man, because the guy's a legend. And he, you know, he lost the fight, but look at, look at the man's output. Look at his output. So happy to see Nick Diaz perform like that. You know, if you're being completely honest, he didn't look like he should be inside the octagon. But still, six years, seven years, and you come back and you rip into the body like that. I uh, love to see it. Massive credit to Robbie Lawler. He was a man possessed. You know, Nick Diaz could have got out the wheelchair and Robbie Lawler would have still been that angry and that possessed. You know, he was going to get that win back. Credit to him. Uh, Valentina, what can we say? You know, there's, there's the same thing to say every time. She's the GOAT. Brian Ortega, man, two times. Two times you gave me heart attack, Mr. Ortega. My goodness. Now, one more thing before I want to get into what I want to say with a smoke break. The AI predictions on the pay-per-view, man, as good as mine. As good as mine, guys. It went eight out of nine, which is, you know, that's nasty from the alien. But yeah, guys, the smoke break topic, man. I want to just give a massive shout out to everyone. You know, if you're a part of this community, if you tune into my content, and so many people do, man. Guys, I just want to make this smoke break about you, man. I want to say to you, amen. Thank you. You know, I get a lot of support, man. You know, and it, it makes me grateful. It makes me want to continue to put the work in, week in, week out. Super grateful, guys. So yeah, amen to the amen gang. All right, my homies, let's jump into the main card. Let's go. All right, guys, we've got Misha Serkinov taking on Christoph Jotko. My goodness. You know, guys, when I ask my brain to use reasonable logic to try to find a, a confident prediction, when I ask my brain to do that, this is what my brain does. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? You know, this one's really a pick em, man. Misha Serkinov also moving down to middleweight. But yeah, let's try break it down. So Misha Serkinov is a grappler. He wants to grab a hold of you, take you to the mat. From there, he's looking to use good jujitsu, right? Strong, heavy top control. If he can take your back, he's happy to do that too. Misha Serkinov is simply looking to out grapple you. Now, Christoph Jotko, I would kind of describe this guy as a grappler too, but he's a much better striker than Misha Serkinov. He's not a better striker in terms of punching power, but if you want to stick a one-two in somebody's face or, or just stick a jab, Christoph Jotko is going to be way better at doing that. You know, Christoph Jotko had a horrible run, but then he put together some nice wins, you know, against Alan Amadovsky, Mark andre Eric Anders. All of these fights are pretty nice performances from Christoph Jotko. Now, he did lose to Sean Strickland, but... You know, Sean Strickland, good pressure boxer. So in this one, man, I'd kind of have to assume that Christoph Jotko can win this one. And the logic behind that prediction isn't exactly super strong. And that's because I'm not too high on Christoph Jotko. But on the flip side, you know, Misha Serkinov, if you can clip this man on the chin or behind the ear, you know, who remembers when Vulcan Ozdemir clipped him behind the ear? You know, you can put down Misha Serkinov, but Christoph Chotko isn't putting anyone down. And this one, man, you can just go back and forth on reasons as to why it's a dodgy matchup. My final prediction, though, I'm going to go with Christoph Chotko. More output, and he needs to avoid the mat to win this one. My numbers, guys, I'm going to put Christoph Chotko around minus... 150 and minus 150 represents winning six times out of ten you know i'd say that's 
around the area for Christoph Jocko. And the actual numbers, we've got Christoph Jocko minus 170. So yeah, I think the I think Vegas have got it right again. You know, Misha dropping down to 185. Not too sure how he's going to look cutting that extra weight. His chin has never been great. And he kind of needs this fight on the mat. If the fight's not on the mat, maybe he pushes Jocko up against the fence. But is he going to keep him there round after round? Not too sure. So yeah, I'll slightly lean towards Jocko with the output. Being more experienced at 85 too. Yeah, difficult prediction though. All right, homies, super, super sick matchup. Fire matchup in my opinion. We've got Joe Selecki taking on Jared Gordon. Both of these guys are really, really decent grapplers. Joe Selecki likes to grapple the jiu-jitsu way. Jared Gordon likes to grapple the wrestling way. So that's going to make for a fun matchup. You know, if Joe Selecki and Jared Gordon choose to initiate any grappling, they're good grapplers. Two different styles coming up against each other. Now, usually when you've got two good grapplers, they kind of like to play it out in the striking. I hope that doesn't happen because if it does... Joe Selecki might get his first loss inside the UFC. And I've picked Joe Selecki every time. What is he, 2-0? 3-0 at the moment is Joe Selecki. You know, every time he displays what he's about, he grappled Matt Wyman, submitted Austin Hubbard, and grappled Jim Miller. This matchup is definitely the step up that Joe Selecki needs. Jared Gordon is, you know, he's a decent name. A really good wrestler, really good cardio. And to be honest, man, he can bang better than all the guys that Joe Selecki has fought. So yeah, Joe Selecki has to grapple here. He has to take control of the wrestler, take the back. You know, Jared Gordon has been knocked out a few times. Diego Ferreira, Joaquim Silva, Charlie Olives. But all of these guys are really talented strikers. Even Diego Ferreira and Charlie Olives, who are primarily jiu-jitsu guys, they can strike. Whereas Joe Selecki is still quite early in his career. I wouldn't like to see him striking with Jared Gordon. You know, I want to see him grapple here. So that's what we've got in this one, guys. Really difficult prediction to make because I respect Jared Gordon. I respect Joe Selecki. I'm gonna stick with Joe Selecki and I just hope he sticks on the back of Jared Gordon, you know? Jiu-Jitsu is what Joe needs to do. If he doesn't, Jared Gordon takes a name of an up-and-comer. My numbers, I'm gonna keep them pretty close. I'll put Joe Selecki minus 120, Jared Gordon plus 110. And the actual numbers, we've got Joe Selecki minus 140, and that line has come down a bit. So a bit of money going on Jared Gordon. You know, if Jared Gordon can just say to himself, look, I'm a wrestler, but I'm not going to wrestle this time. Because if I wrestle, Joe Selecki gets to use his jujitsu. Yeah, I'm going to box this time. Time to box. It always comes down to who can implement their game plan, who can impose their will. I'm going to say Joe Selecki can grapple. But man, this one... Yeah, it's a good one. All right, my homies, we've already broke this one down, but we're going to break it down again because the UFC like to do that. They put fights together and they don't happen and then you get to break them down again. This one's Aspen Lad taking on Macy, female MGK, Chiazon. I'm from the land till I die. Yo, Macy Chiazon is one of my favorite fighters, man. She's super game to strike. Her grappling, you know... She has been exploited there a couple times. She's not the next Damien Meyer on the mat, but she is still a big girl. You know, she used to fight at featherweight. She's a gamer, man. Is she a better wrestler than Aspen Ladd? You know, absolutely not. But she can still wrestle a little bit. You know, she's going to try to choke you out from the bottom, throw up triangles, arm bars. Now, the only place that Macy cheers on, in my opinion, is going to win this one. Like I said, she will throw the armbar on the triangle. You don't expect her to get it. The place that Macy cheers on is going to win this one is the striking. You know, she is a better striker than Aspen Ladd. Aspen had a great moment where she had this motivational speech from her coaches after round two against Yana Kuniskaya. And she basically ran at the opponent and just... Yeah, it was nasty. 
you love to see that, you know? Round three, getting nasty. Yeah, love to see it. Yeah, I've already broke this one down, guys, so I'm just gonna stick with the same prediction that I made. I'm gonna take female MGK, Macy cheers on. Is there a good chance that Aspen Lad out-wrestles her, makes me look silly? There's a good chance. But is there a small chance that Macy cheers on, stuffs the takedowns, and just uses that till I die type striking, you know, MGK style? There's a small chance that happens. So that's what I'm going to go with here. Let's go Macy cheers on. My numbers, man, you know, I would give Aspen Lad the favourite if I'm being brutally honest, because her takedowns are super strong. She's a really good wrestler with sick BJJ, in all honesty. So I'll put Aspen Lad minus 130, but my prediction is still going to be Macy cheers on. And the actual numbers, I do expect Macy cheers on to be the underdog and she is plus 175. Now you're not going to go lay five units on Macy cheers on. But if you've got a quarter unit or a half unit to spare. Yeah, I like it, man. Female MGK. Let's go, Macy. Let's go. All right, my homies. Co-main event. We've got Kevin Home Alone Holland taking on Kyle Dorcas. Now for anyone that's been watching my channel for a long time or anybody that's listened to me break down a Kevin Holland fight. Guys, I've been waiting to break down the co-main. Kevin Holland is the homie. He is the homie. Now, if you haven't seen Home Alone, the Christmas film, please go watch Home Alone. But I expect everyone has seen Home Alone, right? There's a kid, the main character in Home Alone is called Kevin, and he gets left home alone. What else could we be forgetting? So yeah, you put two and two together, Kevin Home Alone Holland, he's the homie of this channel. And you know, I'm not friends with Kevin, you know, he doesn't know that he's the homie, but hey, Kevin Holland, man, the homie, Home Alone, let's go. Now guys, let's be completely honest, Kevin Holland, man, I hope you've been wrestling. I really hope you've been wrestling. You know, the homie likes to joke around. Speaking to Habib when he's fighting Derek Brunson. I hope Habib sent him to Dagestan. You know, just... You need to get that takedown defense a little bit improved. Kevin Holland. When the fight hits the mat, he is a black belt. So, don't completely underestimate him. You know, he's gonna knock you out from the bottom. Jacare style. That was crazy, by the way. Just crazy. So if Kyle Dorcas does establish the takedown, you know, Kevin Holland, man, it's not gonna look like Derek Brunson is on top or Marvin Vittori is on top. This is Kyle Dorcas, a man who has some pretty good jujitsu himself, but I would still lean towards Kevin Holland having the better BJJ. Now the striking on the feet, I'm leaning more towards Kevin Holland. Guys, I'm not making this pick just because Kevin Holland is the homie. But I'm picking home alone. All day. Like I said, man, in all seriousness, if Kevin Holland has improved his wrestling, his takedown defense, you know, he's going to light up Kyle Dorcas on the feet. Especially at range, you know, the teeps to the body, the kicks. And then you look at Kevin Holland landing that one-two down the barrel against Buckley. Yeah, Kevin Holland all day. You know, I hate it when one of my favorite fighters is fighting because... I always question, man, am I picking this guy because I'm a fan or is it really Kevin Holland all day? Personally, I really believe it's Kevin Holland all day here. You know, go to the mat, you got a black belt. The wrestling should improve and the striking, I'm leaning towards Kevin. So yeah, all the flags pointing towards the homie and that's going to be the pick. Inside the distance, maybe not because Kyle Dorcas, super tough. My numbers on this one, I'm going to put Kevin at least a minus 200. And we've got Kevin Holland minus 150. Wow, so people kind of, kind of leaving him again. You know, like his mum left him. Kind of jumping off the bandwagon, eh? Nah, I think Kevin here, minus 150, guys. It's going to happen. All right, my homies, main event. If you've enjoyed this breakdown, please hit the subscribe button. Hamza, smash the like button. We've got Tiago Santos taking on Johnny Walker. This one's a banger, man. 
two nasty Brazilians. You know, you look at the work Thiago Santos has done over his whole career. And it's just nastiness. You know, how many guys has Thiago Santos knocked out? Jack Marshman, GM3, Jack Hermanson, Anthony Smith, Eric Anders, Jimmy Manoa, Jan Blakovic. You know, you can go even further back than that. Thiago Santos is just a wrecking machine. Now, I do want to mention, though, John Jones kind of disabled him. And by that, I mean John Jones beat up the legs. You know, he destroyed the knees of Thiago Santos. And I'm not talking, you know, he beat up the legs and that should be avoided in this fight. What I'm talking about, guys, is he beat his legs up so bad that Thiago Santos had to learn how to walk again. You know, since that John Jones fight, he got finished by Glover Teixeira and dominated by Alexander Rakic. The opponent, Johnny Walker, a guy that came into the UFC and instantly got himself a lot of hype, right? You look at what he'd done to Khalil Roundtree, Justin Ledet, Misha Serkinov. All of these fights, Johnny Walker is finishing the opponent in bizarre fashion. You know, hook kick, flying knee, Muay Thai elbows. You know, he's saying to everyone, look, I'm not just going to get in there and finish ya. It's going to be something nasty. But Corey Anderson was the first man to say not today. And he, you know, he kind of broke the ego a little bit of Johnny Walker. Then Nikita Krylov, a UFC veteran, was able to get takedown after takedown and basically fatigue Johnny Walker. Now at this point, it's not looking too good. You look at his last matchup against Ryan Spann. Ryan Spann hurt him. You know, he hurt him bad. But Johnny Walker recovered. You know, he didn't look for a way out of that fight. Got hurt really bad, but you could see that he really wanted to bounce back and win this one. And that's exactly what he did. He was able to get out of the mount position. And later on, you know, dropping those hammers and those nasty elbows. All four of Johnny Walker's wins inside the UFC have been finishes. Elbows, hook kicks, flying knees. This man is violent and the opponent is super violent too and that makes for a beautiful main event and potentially a sweaty bet either side. I think you can make arguments for both sides. Another argument that you could make in this fight, Thiago Santos is a wrecking machine like I said but Johnny Walker is like six foot six. You know, Thiago Santos did spend most of his career at middleweight. He steps up to 205, beats Eric Anders in Brazil, beats Jimmy Manoa, and beats Jan Blakovic. And that's when he gets the title shot against John Jones. He done really well in this fight too, you know, went 25 minutes. But the repercussions of this fight, you know, when you've got to learn to walk again, that might be it. It might just be it. And if you're trying to find some evidence that it may be it for Thiago Santos, you look at the two fights after John Jones, both of these fights are, are losses. Now, having said all of that, Thiago Santos does possess a nasty, nasty high level of striking. A super powerful level of striking. We've seen Johnny Walker's chin cracked. Can Thiago Santos put him down? Despite the knee injury, despite being 37, despite stepping up to 205? The answer to that question is yes. But I'm going to take Johnny Walker in this one. I think he's more of a 205er, more in his prime, and he hasn't had to learn how to walk again. Now, if you're a bit scared to pick Johnny Walker or Thiago Santos, maybe you just bet on fight doesn't go the distance. You know, that line's got to be minus 400 or something. But you could find another line to put with that and get a plus money double, right? But for me, guys, I'm going to take Johnny Walker to TKO Tiago Santos. And if that doesn't happen, yeah, best believe it was Tiago getting the stoppage. My numbers on this one, guys, I'm going to put Johnny Walker minus 130, Tiago Santos plus 100. And we've got Tiago Santos minus 170, Johnny Walker plus 150. Yeah, it's understandable because you see Johnny Walker get clipped by Corey Anderson. You see him get taken down by Nikita Krylov. You see him getting clipped by Ryan Spann. So when you look at Thiago Santos and you see knockout after knockout after knockout, 
year by year, you put two and two together and that might be the play. But for me, guys, I don't like the knee surgery that Thiago Santos had. I don't like that he had to learn how to walk again. And Johnny Walker is a big boy, you know, six foot six. He's a big guy. So yeah, guys, let me know your straight plays, doubles, props, parlays, all of that good stuff. And guys, remember, keep your eyes to the sky and never glue to your shoes. Mac Miller. All right, peace.